Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Potcotter, and you're listening to Call Talk for March 18th, 2020. Today's topic is, let's clear the smoke about drug testing and background screening, a 2020 update. If you're listening live, we invite you to be part of the show and ask questions. Here's how you do it. Email me at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com. I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to be listened to any time of the day at benchmarkportal.com. And now I'd like to introduce the host of the show, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you, Alan, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. As you know, it's our aim to keep our contact center community up to date on the latest items that impact your ability to manage your centers in the best way possible. That's why I wrote the article, Coronavirus and Managing Your Contact Center, Don't Panic, Plan and Prepare an article I wrote when the crisis was just breaking in February of 2020, and we hosted a special edition of Call Talk with Dr. Charles Fenzi last week that's focused on the pandemic. And today, another important topic to our audience, drug screening. To bring you up to date on drug testing and background screening trends that are facing call centers, uh, we wanted to uh, discuss this some more. What's happening with marijuana legislation across the country, the latest drug testing developments, and other state and local updates affecting the industry in 2020. Because it can all be pretty confusing for managers who face these challenges every day. And add to that the complications that will be felt due to the coronavirus pandemic during 2020, and we all need some special help and guidance. And that's why we have brought in an expert on the topic for you, Christine Kuneen, CEO of Higher Image. Christine is a veteran of Call Talk, having already been interviewed for our June 2018 show, which I encourage you to listen to as well, which was extremely well received. Welcome back to the show, Christine. Thanks for having me, Bruce. I'm excited to be here, and uh, I can't believe that was almost two years ago. It just feels like yesterday that <laughs> we were having this, these discussions. Where does the time go? I'm telling you, it's so fast, so fast. But uh, Christine has been CEO of Higher Image LLC for the past 15 years, and her company is nationally accredited, specializing in background screening and drug testing. Uh, Christine is the past chair of the Professional Background Screeners Association, and she's active with the Society of Human Resource Management, or SHRM, at both the national and local level. Uh, She's a frequent speaker at events throughout the country, and uh, so we're just really delighted to have her with us. So, Christine, the coronavirus is impacting every facet of life these days as we record this show. Uh, How is it impacting background screening and testing uh, for drugs so far? And first, let's talk about the background screening with court records, education verification, et cetera, that part of it. And second, can people still go for drug testing or will the labs be too busy for employment screening tests because of uh, the fact that they're overloaded with coronavirus tests? Yeah, it's a great question, Bruce, and one that we're faced with every day, uh, employers calling in with all sorts of questions like that. Uh, Let's start first from the background screening side of things. We are starting to see some court closures. So as, you know, everything is closing down, a lot of the courts are closing up. So that may impact uh, providers' ability to get those criminal records out Uh, Right now we're seeing California, Georgia, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Michigan are kind of on the front lines of just shutting down those courts. Sometimes there's online subscriptions and ways to get those court records, but if you need to go into those courthouses, that may be impacted. You may not get your criminal records back in a timely manner. Uh, We're also seeing a lot of school closures, obviously, as they're shutting down schools and um, a lot of uh, employers shutting down. So on the verification side of things, uh, employers that need that prior education verification or prior employment checks, uh, we are starting to see some delays there. Not too, too bad yet, but I anticipate as this grows um, and as more and more things are shut down, we'll see some delays there. 
Um, I would say the biggest questions we are getting though right now are related to drug testing um, from both the applicants and the employers. Um, and so here's what we know so far uh, so that your listeners know. Um, as for lab-based urine testing, which happens to be still the most popular uh, way of drug testing, applicants and employees who are tested at a patient service center, those are those Quest or LabCorp type of facilities, um, they are not the facilities where folks are coming in to test for COVID-19. So you keep hearing a lot on the news like, oh, Quest and LabCorp, they're going to help with all this testing that's coming out um, that's supposed to be ramping up. Uh, the COVID-19 testing is collected by the ordering clinician and is mailed to the lab testing facilities, not the patient service center. So you're not going to have those germs and those tests, um, you know, seen in those patient service centers. Um, and those patient service centers, they're cleaning, they're sterilizing their offices, um, and they're asking anyone who doesn't feel well and are exhibiting those flu-like symptoms uh, to just not come to their offices. Uh, but like any other public place right now, you know, to say, oh, well, they're totally safe. Um, they're like any other um, public location right now. So if you are going to one of those centers, you know, follow those CDC guidelines on hand washing and using those back antibacterial sanitizers, uh, sanitizers and don't touch your face. Uh, so kind of following those guidelines would be good, but not to worry. They're not doing those tests there. Um, and then at the moment, we don't know of any closures of those patient service centers. That could happen, too, as, you know, maybe staff get sick or there's quarantines in certain cities. Uh, but right now, we haven't heard of any, so they're continuing to operate in their normal hours. Um, and then as for the processing of tests, that's kind of the next level, right? So your, your um, employee goes into the facility or your applicant, get their test done, and then that sample gets ma mailed to a lab. We have not seen delays yet on that, but I wouldn't be surprised to say that we would see um, some delays as this COVID-19 testing does ramp up because the Quest and the lab cores and all those are going to be processing those tests. So um, again, no delays yet, but it could could very well be happening in the future, near future. Okay, great. That is really good information. So as we sit here on uh, March 18th, uh, no delays so far, but if there comes a time in which those uh, lab companies have to repurpose or reposition some machinery or some people uh, so that they're concentrating on the COVID-19, then uh, we just have to be prepared for that. So that's really good. As you're going through the uh, guidelines and all that sort of thing, I was thinking, you know, the washing hands I've gotten really good at, but not touching my face I'm not so good at. <laughs> I, don't <know> about <laughs> other people. I know. I don't think any. I don't think any of us realize how many times we touch our face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and uh, it was interesting because even Dr. Fauci, who's so well respected, who was on uh, at TV, at one point he puts his hand, you know, uh, one hand under his elbow and the other hand up on his face. <laughs> so he got called out <laughs> by one of the uh, the interviewers on it. It is, it's tough. So we have to kind of re uh, repurpose ourselves in a sense. Okay, so well. What if an applicant, how about this one? If an applicant refuses to test because of the pandemic, what should an employer do in that circumstance, Christine? Oh, I am so sorry. I have my uh, fire people here testing the alarm. So I'm trying to tell, tell people to send them a message to not be testing my fire alarms right now. <laughs> um, so as far as applicants who are refusing, we haven't had anybody refuse yet, but they are challenging times, right, for everybody right now. So what I'm telling employers, and again, I can't give any sort of legal advice, but uh, um, I would suggest employers allow for flexibility and be a willing, willing to be a bit out of the norm on this. Um, you know, everybody handles this differently. Different people have different anxiety levels and stress levels related to this. So I would say kind of be a, a little bit more open. Um, one of the alternatives that we're letting our employers know about is to possibly consider different types of testing. There is the oral fluid lab-based test. I strongly recommend them as they have shorter detection windows for marijuana, and they have proven to be very effective tests. Uh, so that's a, an area to maybe consider if you you know if people are afraid to go into those patient service centers, possibly think of different. Okay. Tests. Okay. So the uh, oral fluid lab-based test, and are, are they easy to get and easy to administer? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> uh, to to make it easy, uh, the t the testing still goes to a lab, similar to like the urine test on how that gets shipped out. Um, if it doesn't get shipped to a lab, that means it's an instant test, and some of you may already be using those. 
I don't really put much weight behind those tests. You kind of get what you pay for, those instant tests. Uh, but I do recommend those oral fluid lab-based tests. Uh, the setup is very similar to how an employer sets up the urine testing, um, and your cur their current providers can uh, assist them in that area. And then administering the test itself is also super easy. Um, it could take five minutes for a, a manager to get trained on how to do it. You don't necessarily, you're not touching any of the fluid. You're not touch getting involved with any of the actual test. It's just sitting there with the applicant. There's kind of like a flag on the end of it. It has to be facing up so you know they're doing it the right way. They're not trying to kind of place it in a bad spot or something like that. And then the applicant or the employee puts it in the baggie, seals it up, and that's what gets shipped out to the lab. So it's super, super easy. Okay. Now that's good to know. So it's easy to train up for, train somebody up for, uh, then easy to actually do. Uh, and nobody really comes in contact with any of the fluid because of the fact that it's all handled by the applicant who ends up sealing it ahead of time before giving right. it over to the manager. Is that correct? Exactly. Yep. They don't have to touch it at all. Okay. Now that's really good information. Uh, another thing, you mentioned uh, marijuana and a shorter detection window. What exactly does that mean? That's another great question, Bruce. Uh, the drug test for marijuana, it's actually a test uh, called uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, or what most of us call it, THC. Um, so that's what we're really testing. We're not testing marijuana itself. We're testing for the THC components. And THC can remain in a person's system for a really long time, and each of us break it down in different ways or, you know, if we're using. Um, as of today, there is no test on the market, market that says there's somebody who's high right now. And believe me, if we could test for that or if I could develop that test, we'd be gazillionaires. But there's no test out there because scientifically it's hard to test because THC gets in our metabolites and into our system. Um, so it varies based on each individual person. And if you're a habitual user versus a casual um, type of usage, how much THC stays within your body will also vary. So when you're doing a urine test, THC is actually detected for kind of a, when I say a longer kind of window, um, a lot of times we'll see up to 30 days for those more uh, habitual type of users. So if they're constantly, you know, smoking a joint here and there or eating a gummy, um, that could show up for up to 30 days. But when you use the saliva or those oral fluid tests, it detects those more recent usage. So um, it could be from a couple of minutes that they've actually ingested up to a couple of days. So it's just more of that kind of shorter detection window. But again, I, I caution folks to say there actually is no test to say somebody is high right at that current moment. But kind of that oral fluid is our best indicator of that recent usage. Okay, so really what we're doing is to test for the recent usage. It's kind of a, a trailing uh, test, and uh, but that's good to know because that gives an idea of uh, the person's behavior, you know, outside the workplace as well. So, okay, very good. So, so in your opinion, should employers still test for marijuana? I know there's been a lot of discussion about this, uh, you know, both in the halls of um, state legislatures, et cetera, and as well as in workplaces, places like SHRM, et cetera. What, what, what's your feeling? Should employers still test for marijuana? So what we're seeing is we're, we're definitely seeing a trend of employers that are in non-safety sensitive uh, environments that they're removing marijuana testing. You do have um, New York City, which is banning pre-employment um, testing of marijuana. The state of Nevada is gonna, going to be banning that. Um, so there is legislation we're seeing that may impact that. Uh, but with the laws surrounding medical marijuana even that are in place, um, you know, in about two-thirds of the states out there and more states that are legalizing that recreational marijuana, it has become a real issue for employers to manage and then to also consider, do you want to still be testing for it? Well, one of the things that um, we have seen, too, just in terms of client contracts is sometimes there's a contractual obligation to have employees uh, and 1099s actually uh, tested for purposes of obtaining a contract. And I don't know whether those contracts are kind of out of date at this point, but still being passed around. But yeah. I'm sure that you have a lot of clients and talk to a lot of people who have to deal with that. And I'm sure that there are people on the phone or on the, the, uh, the line here who are listening 
who have to deal with that sort of a situation. Could you sort of give us some guidance there? Yeah, that's uh, definitely great points, Bruce, because, and actually every time an employer calls us and they're thinking of removing it, we actually, you know, kind of make them think, like, are there any other reasons you're testing outside of just your and company's substance abuse policy, but especially with contact centers and call centers around the country, a lot of them are working with different types of companies that are requiring a specific criminal search, a specific drug test. Um, so I would go back to those contracts, make sure you know what is required. And if you really are don't want to be testing for marijuana anymore and you want to remove it and it's still in there with those contracts, talk to those companies that you're working with because they might be going through the same thing at their organization and they may be more lenient than they were years ago just with these trends of this legalization of marijuana. But, you know, Bruce, as we're talking about this, um, you know, it comes to mind for me too, another potential issue that I see testing for marijuana and we have seen this happen been, we've seen people who have lost their jobs because there's random testing or DOT testing, um, you know, these regulated type of industries that they're required to randomly test people throughout their employment. Um, we've seen this proliferation, right, of CBD products out on the market. You can get these lotions and creams and they're going to heal your arthritis or you can put it, you know, use it for your dog and they're going to heal almost anything, right? Um, but those products, they're, they may have some THC in there. Um, and there's no products out on the market today. Um, well, there's one. I'm sorry. Excuse me. There's one product, CBD product, that's approved by the FDA. All the others are not pre-approved by FDA. So it's a little bit of the wild, wild west out there. So, And some of them might even say, oh, there's no THC. But there's no way. There's, it's not regulated to say how much THC is in these CBD products. So you have someone innocently putting on lotion on their hands and arms or whatever, wherever they have arthritis pain, um, to ease that pain, um, and they may unwittingly be um, having THC enter their system. So with that, if they had a drug test, they may fail. So employers are faced with that. What we tell employers, especially those that have the random testing, is put something out there to your applicants, your employees, let them know that CBD products can cause them to fail that marijuana test. But again, to me, that's another reason to consider possibly removing marijuana as more and more people are using these CBD products that are so easily gotten out there on the market. Right. Oh, really good point. Um, I think that uh, all of our listeners would probably want to consider how that uh, fact, you know, that these uh, uh, CBD things have been put into other uh, products, uh, oils and creams, et cetera, could have an impact on them. And for and those... Bruce, well, and Bruce, just to, just to add to that, too, just this might help your uh, employers, too, is just it's it's super easy to remove it. So when you're dealing with a provider, you just simply tell them you want to remove it. It's not a big deal. The labs can easily take that out of the testing. You might need a different kind of code on your forms that people are going to the labs, but it's super easy to make the change too. So it's nothing difficult mm -hmm. from that standpoint. Okay. Well, very good. Very good. Another thing sort of popped into my head too, and that is if you're in an industry where you have to do it uh, for good reason and uh, you want to make sure that you're not – pulling people in to the employment tube who don't know uh, the secrets you just told us or the information you just told us, Christine, uh, maybe a, a nicely placed uh, half-minute video or one-minute video on your website in the employment section explaining why, you know, you need to do this and uh, what it takes and the fact that uh, be careful because you may be using creams, oils, or other products that are not approved by the FDA and, in fact, may have some THC in them. Uh, do it nicely. Do it in a way that actually imp uh, sort of supports your branding instead of destroys it, and you'll both inform. Uh, you'll bring down your recruiting costs and your, your fails, if you will, and uh, that could be a good way of handling it. Do you have any thoughts on that, Christine? I think that's a great idea. Um, but I will say, though, at the point where someone's coming in to apply for a job and they're going to get drug tested, if they've been using those creams and oils and you go send them right then for the drug test, they're going to fail. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. it would be good if that's... it would be good if there was more out there and, uh, you know, like Sherm and the HR magazines and like getting it out there right. to, to folks who are who are out there just, you know, reading it in the news right. type of thing. Absolutely, and, and and this is why if you put it on your website, 
In other words, people who come uh, to your website because they're interested in employment, uh, if you let them know at that point in time, maybe if they're using some of these creams and things, they'll either look more closely into them or they'll stop using them for a while at yeah, least. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, true. that's a thought. Okay, so uh, so here's a you know, should contact center managers still drug test their employees and potential employees, and uh, if so, what are some of the benefits? Well, I, you know, it's not just because I sell it. I do firmly believe absolutely um, employers should still drug test it. The only thing they should be considering is possibly removing marijuana, but other than that, um, they should be, um, have they, and they should have a substance abuse policy in place um, and, you know, have those drug tests. Um, and some of the reasons would be, you know, increased productivity and reduce, reduce turnover from people who are not habitual drug users. Um, you reduce absenteeism, tardiness. Uh, it's definitely a safer work environment. Um, and let's not forget, many call centers are required to conduct drug tests, you know, as we mentioned, based on those contractual requirements. So uh, that's another reason. But I definitely strongly suggest that folks review their substance abuse policy and consider, uh, you know, again, removing marijuana, but definitely, definitely um, still uh, drug testing. I think it's an important, important part for okay. employers. Okay, good. And one of the things you mentioned was a uh, uh, sort of a substance abuse policy, a formal substance abuse policy. Uh, do employers need to have a policy before they test? And is there anything else that our listeners may need to know about this sort of a policy? Yeah, that's uh, another good point uh, and question, Bruce. Uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I can't provide you with legal advice, but I have worked in this area, obviously, for quite some time. Um, and in talking with numerous employment attorneys and just seeing the industry out there, uh, again, it's not my legal, this is my non-legal opinion, but yes, you need a substance abuse policy. Um, are there lawyers that might say no in certain instances? I would uh, maybe, but <laughs> uh, better be safe than sorry. Definitely have a substance abuse policy before you ever do your first test. Or if you're already drug testing, go back, look to see if you have a policy in place, um, and if not, get one. Um, but everyone, you know, hopefully everybody listening right now has a drug screening process in place and has the policies in place. But what I want to stress, too, is, okay, great, you're going to be like, oh, I already have a policy in place, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, but you probably haven't looked at it in a long time, and maybe it's not even up to you. Maybe you're just the manager of your uh, contact center, um, so it's not up to you to look at all those policies. You just know that there's one in place. I strongly, strongly suggest that folks take a, uh, take a look at it. It might not be you, but get your legal department, HR department, um, really looking at it because there have been so many changes um, in that area, so most folks need to update it. One chance change that uh, we're seeing is, you know, with all the medical marijuana, um, do you have a reasonable accommodation under the American with Disabilities Act for those testing positive for the medical marijuana and holding a medical marijuana card? You really want to make sure you have that. We've seen that in a lot of court cases. So that's one area. The other area is if you are in multiple states, or even if you're in a state that has recently changed with the recreational marijuana um, or some other laws that they've changed, you want to look at it and make sure that you're um, you know, in compliance with the state laws that you're in. Basically, to all these state laws we're seeing have little nuances. They're all fairly different, although similar, they're different. So what we've heard from attorneys is have one general policy and then consider having like state addendums for the different states um, just to make sure you're covering what those little crazy nuances are to those laws and you don't have to keep changing your overall substance abuse policy. But definitely, definitely an area that I recommend folks take a look at and make sure what you're doing, <laughs> you as the one who are, is administering the test, um, is actually following that policy and following the laws as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. And policies are those sorts of things that get put in place, get put in uh, employer manuals and stuff, and oftentimes don't get looked at for years. So I think that's great advice to take a look back at it. Do some spring cleaning. You know, it is spring. It's a good time to do some spring cleaning on uh, on those policies. So, okay, we've talked a lot about marijuana and drug testing. Um what, what else do contact center managers need to know as it relates to background screening? 
Yes, we have spent a lot of time on drug testing. But yes, uh, there are so many other things that, that folks should be considering. So what we're seeing a lot of, you know, when the federal government doesn't necessarily change laws, but there's a lot of times state and local laws changing, um, we have seen a lot of changes as it relates to background checks. Uh, one area would be, you probably have heard of these salary history bans that came out of the gender equity kind of legislation of you can't ask someone necessarily what they made at their last job. A lot of states and cities are now passing bans on employers not asking. Um, so if you have that on your application and you're asking and you're in one of those jurisdictions, you know, say California, um, you can't be asking that on the initial application of what they used to make. A lot of employers are now saying, what's your desired salary, instead of asking for the past salary. But as it relates now to background screening, if you're doing an employment verification, you want to make sure that you're not asking them to enter what their salary is. So work with your provider too. Maybe you took it off your initial application, but it's still getting asked at the background screening um, phase of the process. So you don't want to be asking in certain states. It's allowed in, you know, federally it's still allowed. I could see possibly legislation in the future on that. But as so many jurisdictions now that that's coming up, you want to take a look at that. The other area we see are... Um, you probably heard of this ban the box or, you know, take that question off the initial application of take that box off that says, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Um, and we're now seeing them kind of turn into or morph into these fair chance initiatives where, you know, it's kind of giving ex-offenders a second chance. And I think us as a society, we can agree there has to be some sort of help for people coming out of the prison system and how do they reenter society. Uh, but these fair chance initiatives put a lot of burdens on you as the employer um, to follow. So, and it ties directly with the criminal record reporting, right? So on what you're allowed to use, what you're allowed to see. And say a, a criminal record comes back, what are you allowed to do with it? How do you have to notify them? There's a lot of legislation there. So you want to be working closely with your provider to understand those different laws. Um, and then again, there's just like these technical statutes when you do background checks. It's under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. We're seeing more and more um, lawsuits in that area because it's kind of like these ambulance chaser lawyers <laughs> that are just looking for bad forms out there. They're going on and seeing if you have forms um, and they have any type of technical violations. Um, and then they're, they're getting these class action lawsuits. So compliance is a big, big issue in this area for sure. Wow. Yeah, no, those are uh, really big issues and uh, problems. I mean, it's uh, tough enough to manage these days, and now we have to worry about these added uh, things. But it's good to know about them. Uh, uh, knowledge is power, as we say. Exactly. Okay, well, listen, we've, we have been through a lot of really good stuff. I know that Alan has a couple of questions, and uh, we're, we're uh, getting toward the end of our time here. So why don't we go over to Alan and see what those questions are? Hello. Hey, Bruce. It's Christine over here. I didn't hear if there was any questions asked. It oh, okay. All right. Well, let's see. I think we can do a cut and paste, so that's what we'll do. Yeah. Um, okay. Alan, please. <laughs> Go. yes, You'll be no, able sorry. to cut and paste. Okay. Yes. So this is uh, from Jennifer, and the question is, does it cost more to have oral-based testing over urine? That's a good question. Um, no, it's it's similar type of pricing, so it's not much cheaper and it's not much ex more expensive. So work with your provider, but it's a it's generally you're going to be in that same ballpark of what you're paying now for your urine testing would be the similar for the uh, oral fluid lab based testing. Okay, very good. And I have nothing to add to that. Do you have any other questions, Alan? Yep, we have one more from Tom, and he is asking if courts are closed. How do I know if I should move forward with hiring or not? How do I know if they have cr a criminal record? That's another good question. Um, definitely you may not know um, if the court is closed because it might take some time. So you either may have to delay the hiring on that person or at least know, hey, we're hiring you pending the results of this background check. But if something were to return that you know we can't work with you on, um, it might change things. So you may have to get a more, a little more creative and flexible in that area uh, based on these court closures that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So sort of have a contingent hiring situation, is that right? Exactly, yep. Um, you right. know, kind of just be ready for it, yep. Yep, okay. Well, those are good questions. 
Well, thank you very much, Christine. Is there any are there any final uh, thoughts you want to share with us before we uh, wrap up the show? No, I think you know just staying on top of what's going on out there in the industry and and following those local laws in your areas are really important um, as they're ever changing. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, uh, back over to Alan at this point to wrap up the show. All right, thanks for having me. Take care, everybody. Thanks again to Christine and Bruce Belfiore for your insightful discussion on today's show. Be sure to join us next month for another great show or look at our huge selection of archive shows and topics at BenchmarkPortal.com. Then click on Call Talk where you'll find over 10 seasons of this show. From all of us at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. This is Alan Pockotter signing out. Have a great day.